I'm going to ask now, look carefully. Do you see the moon? Yes. Oh, good. Because it's right there. In case oh, it's there. Yeah. I'm looking at that, the other side. Yes, that's the moon. That is the earth. Isn't that something? Look at the perspective, how small it is. She is our closest neighbor, and we are separated by 250,000 miles. It's a quarter million mile separation. And this presentation should illuminate that she's no mere neighbor. Because in those 250,000 miles fit seven planets of our solar system. That's the distance we are separated by. So to shed some light, pun intended, on some of the basic facts about the moon, we are going to turn to the sun. So I'm going to go through this slowly because it does matter. It'll put in things in perspective. As the moon orbits our planet, because that's what she's a satellite, the shadow and the play will remain, as we just saw, an arresting sight. So now let's take a look at the individual phases and how the movements of the moon and the sun appear to us as we watch the northern hemisphere on Earth. So what I'm going to show now is the northern hemisphere version. So we're going to start with the new moon. So if you look at here, I'm going to elaborate on each of these phases. So in the new moon phase, which is the invisible phase of the moon, it's the illuminated side of the moon faces the sun. So the back end of the moon is being illuminated. So if you see the moon is right there, so it's being illuminated on that side. We don't see it from the Northern hemisphere. And the night, the night of the moon faces the earth. So again, only from our perspective on the earth, is it a new moon? After the new moon is the waxing crescent where only a tiny portion is visible to us from the planet. So this is the planetary perspective. This silver sliver grows daily as it's going through its orbit. And the moon's orbit carries the moon's day side farther and farther into view. So as it's spinning, the daylight is going to come into our view more and more. And also every day, the moon rises a little bit later. And from here, we move on to the first quarter. But if you look at it, the moon, if you look at this, it is helpful this way. You know, half of the moon is actually being eliminated. We are only seeing a quarter, half of a half. That's why it's called a quarter. But the reality is that almost half of the moon is being lit up. So a first quarter moon rises around noon and sets around midnight. It's high in the sky in the evening and makes for excellent viewing. So I know it's a difficult to see, but I'm trying. I hope these are helpful. It's telling you the moon is orbiting. It is rotating on an elliptical thing because the Earth is moving as well. So from the first quarter, we move on to what is called the waxing gibbous. And this is when the moon's day side has come into view as much. It's going towards a full moon and the moon is starting to become brighter and brighter in the sky. So then we approach the real half moon which is what we call a full moon, because at this point, the moon is directly facing the sun from our point of view. So it's it's not behind the earth, it's at a distance where the sun is being completely um, illuminating the moon. And so we call it a full moon. And this is when the sun again, illuminates the entire day side of the moon. The moon is directly opposite the sun as viewed from the earth again, and will appear full for a couple of days before the moon moves into the waning gibbous phase. And now the moon is journeying back towards the sun. The lighter side appears to shrink, but the moon's orbit, all it is doing is simply carrying it out of view from our perspective, because it's the shadow of the earth that's falling here. And the moon rises later and later each night. And in the last quarter, also known as the third quarter, the moon looks like it's half illuminated from, again, perspective of the Earth, because what we are really seeing is half of half of the moon, which is a quarter that is being illuminated by the sun. And then we get to what's the waning crescent, because there's a symmetry all this. Moon is nearly back to the point in its orbit where its day side directly faces the sun. You can see the symmetry almost right there. It's on different sides. 
And again, we all see this from our perspective, a very thin curve. And the cycle completes, returns to the new moon, where the moon is invisible to us only. That only us part is very important because the supposed dark side of the moon, when we call it a new moon, because from the planet Earth, we think it's a dark side. But remember, the sun is completely illuminating this end of it. So there is no dark side of the moon, except we don't see it. It is akin to when, you know, in the history periods we refer to as the dark ages. It's only the dark ages to Europeans. It was far from dark ages in India and China, 9th, 10th, all those centuries, 11th. They were not dark ages anywhere else in the world. So it's all perspective. So put that in perspective, pun intended. This picture was taken by a spacecraft I was... It was on its way to investigate an asteroid. So it captured this Earth moon image. And look, you can now see how the same waxing gibbous, waning gibbous, waning crescent, all of it shows up on the apparent dark side of the moon. So it's always these things are named from our human perspective. And today's presentation is about slightly brightening that mental darkness that somehow informs our knowledge. Today, October 17th, is the perfect day to learn more about the moon. And this topic was assigned on purpose today because today is a full moon. It's actually a harvest moon. It's called a hunter's moon because it's in older times in the almanacs, it's signaling winter is coming. So the full moon will peak around 6.30 p.m. this evening. While rising, it may appear bigger than normal and look orange in color. The framework for this presentation is vision. How and what to see. Please do make the time to look at this celestial beauty. Be bathed in a pearly luster. Befold yourself in that level of grace. Consider it as, my, as part of the presentation today. Please go see it. I, I can never do this thing justice. Enjoy yourself tonight. A very, very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for sharing your afternoon with us for our 80th presentation. The Nourishment Projects is about joyous curiosity and being part of something much larger than ourselves. Here are some of the references that inform this presentation. I have tried to mark up the slides that you see. So that's why the presentation re reference page is slightly smaller. Regarding seeing something, do please take a closer look at this work titled Moon and Autumn Grasses. The autumn grasses are pretty obvious. Where is the moon? The perspective here is sublime because it's alerting, how does the East perceive the moon? And for that, I want to take you to this place in Kent, England, which is marked up by this garden. That's a big hint. It is in a garden two hours from London, a place called Sissinghurst. It is famous for the gardens that were designed by Harold Nicholson and his wife, Rita Sackville West. Loveliness abounds in this garden. The place absolutely charms. Even its kitchen garden is beautifully done. And the place also teems with flowers. Everywhere you go, nephophias, I think you call them red hot pokers, they're all everywhere. But the most treasured reservoir of beauty is perceived in that place around May, June. And should you be planning a trip to England, I humbly suggest you consider renting what they call their priest's cottage. And don't be fooled by the name. This priestly domicile doesn't vibe penance at all. It's a beautiful cottage. It's really well um, decorated, shall we speak. In fact, I am betting, because no one is going to rent this cottage otherwise without knowing how to do this, at some point this very night, in fact, because England is about a few hours ahead of us, probably within an hour or so, whoever's rented the place for tonight will be most likely walking back to the cottage after dinner, 
turning in for the evening, you know, early evening, he or she will come back. I'm hoping get a cup of coffee and peer out the window to watch this celestial show that is going to be put on tonight by yours truly. Because as dusk descends, you see that large pot in the center. You will get to view it in moonlight. Here is Sissinghurst's famed moon garden. Walking into a moonlight garden is for me a thrill that never fades. In the absence of any artificial light, one becomes aware of the eerie luminescence that bathes all plants, making white flowers glow and silver leaves gleam. Because these non colors have the ability to bend invisible ultraviolet and infrared light into the visible spectrum, and thereby they give back more than they receive. And as darkness gathers, and the intense jewel like colors in other parts of the garden sink into the shadow, a white garden comes alive and begins to glow in the half light. Magic spills over with the foam of white and silver. And that's not just the flowers. Perhaps if you're lucky, there will be a blur of pearl, the barn owl silently sweeping by like a ninja. You will not hear them suddenly a hoot. I often wonder, what do you think? How do they perceive the moon? Because it shouldn't just be the human perspective all the time. So now, add to this garden, in this scene, add the perfume of the night-scented stalks, the negociana, the jasmine, add to it again the larger perspective, the presence of a nocturnal moth or two fluttering among the flowers. And the enchantment is almost complete. Because the white, gray, and silver plants come into their own in this half light. And the part that completes it is something that you will only privately experience, depending on how much of you you put in there, because you're part of that scenery. With that in mind, let's revisit our painting at the Met. Now, moon and the autumn grasses. Hopefully, the moon is visible to you now, captured in the petals, in the graceful autumn bend of all these plants bowing due to the burden of beauty. There are a lot of layers of understanding in this. You know, autumn, August. August is a very special time for the East. It's the birth of the Buddha. The August moon is extremely, very holy and pious. You know, Sri Lanka, the country, every full moon is a national holiday. So every moon you get one extra day off. And if it's a the month that has two full moons, two days off, the moon has extremely different meanings all over the world. It is such an invitation to poetry. And look at it, this bejeweled celestial delight. How do I love you? Let me count the ways. And I'll be counting the ways as a, probably an engineer because I will see it in the beauty of the science and the beauty of the arts the scattering of wavelengths, what it does for us. I am, if you didn't know, an engineer by training, and it has been an effort for me not to become too wonky in this presentation today. So I'll try to be understandable, but I have no problems. If you have any questions, you tell me. The varied colors appear when the moon is seen, or in this case, photographed through stratified irregular gas layers in Earth's atmosphere. We have an atmospheric blanket that covers the Earth because we have gravity. And it is this blanket, the materials, the, the air that covers us that lets us see the moon in this light. This is a view only from the Earth. Tiny air molecules in, the, in our atmospheric layer scatter light that hits them. That is why you get these shots because red wavelength is largest. So when the moon is down to the ground, but it's very more dense, you get those just stunning, dramatic sunrises and sunset. You don't get a red sky sun sunrise way up in the top. It's almost white then. There's a reason why it's the atmosphere that is doing this painting. 
So materials in the atmosphere, things like water droplets, dust, wildfire smoke, influence the path of the light that affect the new moon's hue. And these colors are specific again to the materials in the atmosphere themselves. So when the moon moves through the densest atmosphere, and it's so it's low to the ground, just above the horizon, it can have an intense, more glowing red, orange hue. In this case, I'm showing brown. And the moon's apparent shape is also altered as the light it reflects travels through the stratified air. And that is because the atmosphere nearest Earth's surface is much denser than high above. And so the path of light traveling through those very densities will bend. I don't, one doesn't need to understand the physics behind it, but as, you, as long as you get the point, because it's bending and when it hits back in your eye, you're seeing it differently. Because of wavelength differences, scientifically speaking, the result is that the moon appears as a squished ellipse, somewhat elliptical, instead of a lunar disk. So it's all perception. That is why the framework for this presentation today, as we had said before, is vision. What are you seeing? How are you seeing it? What does the moon actually look like? Something very familiar. Ta-da! I'm actually holding a piece of the moon. Looks very similar to a rock in the garden, doesn't it? And that is a very, very important clue. Because let's travel back in time. According to science, about 13.8 billion years ago, so I'm going to point out right in the center, all matter exploded outward faster than the speed of light from a state of infinite density. And so that initial singularity, which is commonly known as the Big Bang Theory, is when all this began. Now, I prefer to call it the great radiance, an illumination of the energy, because I find bang is such an unnecessarily violent term. We should give prettier names to science. So give or take a few million years. So say 4.5 billion, say 4.56 billion, whatever, give or take some millions of years. Our planet Earth, as we now know it, formed. So when did the moon come from? And where did it come from? So I would like you to imagine exactly where you're sitting right now, wherever you are. Imagine that you're at that spot billions of years ago in that nascent earth. And that earth at that point was a baby, just a few hundred million years old. And you are sitting where you are at that point of time, looking up at the sky and the night sky is dotted with stars as we dance through the cosmos, because we are hurtling, as you saw in that video, going through space. All of a sudden, you notice a speck, bigger speck, a shiny point of light that keeps getting brighter with each passing day, getting bigger and bigger, and you realize that it's a planet. And that planet is getting bigger and bigger because it is hurtling towards you at a speed of 20,000 miles an hour. Do take that in. So it's a huge planet coming towards you. And that light traveling at the speed of 186,000 miles per second, that is the speed of light, approaches with, and I mean it literally, earth shattering energy. So fathom that soon, a planet at some point when you're sitting there 4.56 billion years ago, a planet that is hurtling towards you is going to blot out what you call the sky. It's going to blot out your entire view. By the time you see it, you're effectively gone because it's not that the sky is falling. In that sense of history, the planet is actually readying for an impact. A collision happens, which likely with the power of the sun vaporized all the matter of both the planets our nascent earth and whichever it was that banged into us. And it became pure gas. And this ball of gas, the result of two planets colliding, was an extremely wide cloud, probably 10 times the size of the earth. It was hot and spun extremely fast. It likely back then had a three hour day cycle in comparison to our 24 hour day cycle. So it's, we've been slowing down. We're still going very fast, but it was much faster before. And then as it spun, 
it cooled rapidly. It caused the vapor to condense and there was a rain of magma coming down in torrents because it's spinning and all that energy is coming, forming into being. And some of that magma drop started lumping together within this swirling cloud because that's what's happening. It's centripetal force. And so the centripetal force of this spinning cloud pulls more and more mass towards this growing little ball. And within a few decades, so now we're not talking millions of years, within a few decades, that's so it's within the span of a human lifetime. In tens of years, the moon is formed. Happy birthday, my love. That's how it came into being. The solar system continued to spin and that remaining cloud mass eventually also birthed a new, bigger planet Earth. That which we now inhabit. This is a theory that science is now propagating. There have been many theories. This is one of the theories. Before somebody, you know, uh, what's his name? Darwin's son, I forgot his first name. His son had said, the mass that where the Pacific Ocean is, you know, that, that cavity that holds the water, one of his theories back then was that mass is what hurled into space and that's the moon. This is now the current space that a planet banged into us, formed this ball of gas, which spun in over years, formed the earth. From that same formation came the moon. So it is not at all accidental that the moon rock looks so similar to the rocks on earth. Similar, but not the same. She is no mere neighbor because we were formed from the same energy. Because keep in mind, the materials on Mars, because it's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, planet, uh, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and all of that, materials from Mars is very metallic. It looks nothing like that from the Earth. It doesn't look similar at all. It's red with olivine streaks, so it's green streaks in there. Venus material looks very different from the materials from Earth or Mars. The fact that the rock on the moon and that of the Earth looks similar is significant. The meaning, what does that mean to us? She's closest to us, looks similar, but only on our beautiful planet, Earth. Only here can life be sustained. We are blessed by sheer luck to rest in the solar system's Goldilocks zone which can sustain our form of life, that it can sustain this beauty, this joy. Keep in mind, same rock formation as the moon, but you cannot have, you don't have this in the moon. And why not? I'll tell you why not very soon. Because other planets in our solar system are not designed to sustain us. We are so human focused that many of, some people imagine that every other entity in this system exists as a resource for us. It does not. We are incapable of living on the moon as of right now. And you'll soon realize why. And the reason this is being pointed out is that the stated goal for many of these astronomically priced space exploration projects is to find new places to mine resources or to find new places to inhabit for the believers of these, these investors believe that the world is ruined cannot be fixed that because we are so acquisitive, we are using up all these resources. We need to find new resource places or need to find places to inhabit, to go colonize. I'm only showing Elon, uh, what's his name, Jeff Bezos, but there are many other people like him who are heavily investing in government in exploration. According to all of them, again, many of them anyway, the world is beyond restoration. Perhaps they don't know it all because I feel this is worth preserving. We're spending billions of dollars off to colonize the moon and beyond because yes, there is journey to Mars and beyond. I'm not denigrating science. I'm just putting it in perspective because what are they doing? You'll be leaving when you leave all of this. Colonize what? You land here and make no mistake in our all of human time. Humans have only spent in sheer measured time, three days and a few hours actually on the moon, like been on the moon itself. Most other things we learn about the moon are through observations. You know, I, I can't observe what chocolate looks like. I would like to taste it. There is a difference between the two. 
there is an enormous amount of research going on in space and planetary um, exploration currently. Some research, some defense, many reasons. But here are some facts about the moon that is undisputed. The moon is covered in a soil that's sand-like, but because the moon's atmosphere has no wind or water, that means that there's no erosion of this sand-like particle. And so the seeming sand-looking thing is razor sharp because nothing is smoothing its edges. So you will not be sinking your feet beach-like in this moon sand by a long shot. And that's the least of it. The temperature on the moon is extreme. It can range from 250 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a positive 250 degrees Fahrenheit to a negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit within centimeters of each other. So I could have different points of temperature on my body. Why is that? Again, because the, the moon lacks atmosphere. And why does the moon lack atmosphere, even though you know we seem to have been made of similar materials at the same similar times? Look again at the picture, that little almost gray spot. And this is the right showing because the moon only sees color because of atmosphere. So I'm glad it's showing it for what it is. The moon is about 1% mass in comparison to the earth, the density of it. So gravitational force is proportional to the mass of an object because its mass is small, its gravitational force is much weaker. So the moon has a weaker gravitational force. It doesn't hold on to the atmosphere. And that is why astronauts bounce around in there. And so by the same token, that astronauts bounce, the atmosphere doesn't stay. So if you, you, know, you buy those cans of oxygen that you can buy, you open it up in the moon, it'll go away, it won't stick around. If you keep that in mind, because there is no atmosphere, there's nothing in that space to transfer energy because you need to transfer energy somehow. You're not doing it in a vacuum. So a hot molecule cannot transfer its heat to cool down, so it retains all the heat. That is why there can be nearly a 500 degree Fahrenheit temperature differences within centimeters of each other. It is not transferring the heat. Also, without an atmosphere, because it has no atmosphere, that means when the light is coming to you on the moon, the light is not being diffracted, diffused in, a, in the density, right? There will not be a beautiful view of any sunrise, although you're looking at the same sun from the moon as you are from the earth. No dreamy sunrise, no dreamy sunset. As we established before, it is the earth's atmosphere that surrounds us, that scatters the light and paints beauty. So on the moon, day and night are effectively the same as popping the blinds open from a dark room to blinding light. There is no beauty you'll be watching in this thing. And geology fascinates me. And I'm not talking about you know, diamonds and gem. The geology I refer to is this planet Earth herself. She mesmerizes me. Because in this planet, you can behold beautiful power. So the Earth's magnetic field protects our planet from incoming cosmic radiation. And it gives it a shield because we have a magnetic core. Without that shield, we would be pelted with charged particles emitted by our sun. So what creates this protection? It is our planet's makeup. Through the same creation of the moon, the same cloud mass, due to our massive volume, this force protects us. The crust that we live in, that crust is about 19 miles deep on average on land and about three miles deep at the ocean bottom. And so the mantle, which is right there, is a hot, viscous mix of molten rock, which is about 1,800 miles thick. So this is about 1,800 miles. It's obviously not drawn to scale. And this designated yellow core is about 1,400 miles thick and is composed of molten iron and nickel. So now we get to the solid inner core. So the inner core, that glowing hot, looks like the sun because it's just about as hot, is roughly 759 mile thick solid sphere of iron and nickel metal. So this is solid. Everything covering this is molten. It is, again, the center is as hot as the sun's surface. 
So this that which is covering the inner core, this motion of molded iron in the Earth's core is what generates a protective magnetic field. So as we spin through our solar system, this magnetic spinning provides the magnetism needed by our compass. So the Earth does so much for us that I can't even begin to tell you. Without this magnetic protection, say which you will not have on the moon, meteorites of varied sizes are constantly falling there. So this presentation is about illumination and I would really like to ignite your imagination. So I ask you, imagine that the moon disappeared not as in a sci-fi movie that you know someone came and blew up the moon you know because then be like who did it there would be conspiracy theories none of that rubbish i just want you to imagine the moon simply did not exist it didn't come into being so you would see a moonless sky first of all it would mean that there would not be beauty there would be because the stars are still there we still have a magnificent heaven beauty would continue to abound just no moon, which is what prompts the question. Imagine, so what? So what if there's no moon? Who cares? I care. Actually, a lot of things happen, starting with the impact of that on water, because it's well established that the moon affects our tides on this planet. So without the moon, there would be less tides, almost 65 to 75% less tides. So the tidal range gets tinier. It doesn't disappear, it just gets tinier. What is that lived experience? It simply means the beach is calmer, more of a lapping of the water than the signature roar or the sound of the ocean. So now please realize that without a surge of the tides, the churning of the water, that ocean would reek of dead fish. Because less moving water means that less food particles are floating up from the bottom feeders because the, the currents and everything, the waters are churning. So it's coming up. And so this is gonna affect everything in the food chain. Because look, these things on the top, these one light, cell light, they count on the bottom feeding dead things to come up. So they feed off that. They in turn feed, you know, clams and barnacles and shrimp-like creatures is all magnified, which are eaten by the smaller fish, bigger fish, and the sharks and the tunas. There is a whole ecosystem, a coastal food chain. And obviously, sitting up on all of, all of this is us. So this would affect the coastal food chain. And it's not just about survival. Creatures like the jellyfish, the eel, use the moon to navigate. Other life forms use the moon to reproduce. Because, for example, a seahorse's reproductive cycle is tied to the full moon, as is the coral reefs. Every year on coral reefs around the world, all coral species spawn en masse on the same night because it's tied to a lunar cycle. Oftentimes it's around fall, like in August, October, November, around that time. Who knows when they do it? But, but it happens on a full moon. In fact, about four hours after moonrise, reproduction in the coral reefs begin. And it's been described like an underwater snowstorm, as if you were swimming through a snow globe. And they are various colors, and they can form clouds of pink, white, yellow dots floating all around. I have a picture from Bermuda when this happened at the August full moon. So the action of the waves and the wind pushed the spawned material into linear wind rows at the ocean surface. So this is not foam. This is the spawn, the pink foam of the coral reefs. And so this oily spawn has a fishy smell and the bright pink color, and it provides food for a variety of wildlife, along with creating the next generation of corals. So without the moon cycle, coral reefs would be dying out because they wouldn't be reproducing as is the coral reefs are dying out because of climate change. When the water gets hotter, these are very temperature sensitive things. So again, without the coral reefs, many of the little fish would lose their hiding places and become more vulnerable to predators. So from water, water affects land. If the moon disappeared, and that would mean there would be less tides, so then less tides are coming up, 
that means the colder, deep ocean water, because then when the water is surging up, and I, those of you who've been with these presentations, I'm so grateful you have been. Last year, we did something called Shifty, which is about the ocean currents. If you can recollect the surge of the underwater that comes up, it brings up cold air that affects the current, the Humboldt currents, all of it. If that cold air is not coming up, that means warm water is pooling, concentrating in the ocean, which leads to longer and earlier hurricane seasons. And so from the water to the land creatures, for example, the wildebeests, their famed migration across the Serengeti, people go to see it. Think about this, on moonless nights, wildebeests are not gonna move much because they cannot see their predators. So the moonlight effectively allows them to be alert at night. The light keeps the wildebeest safe, lets them see the lion and lionesses that await an ambush. In a life of the dark, effectively a perpetual new moon climate, the wildebeest would hunker down and the migration patterns would change. They would eat the foliage nearby, they would eat everything nearby, and effectively eat themselves to starvation. Equally importantly, the foliage they eat up would remove places for other creatures to hide in. If the moon disappeared, all this would happen and much more over time. So another way of looking at this is that the moon currently and through the ages has been beaming protection to all creatures on this planet, great and small. It's been doing things silently, powerfully for millennia upon millennia. The moon has obviously inspired entertainment in the form of movies, in music, I deliberately didn't mark it. I'm sure many of you can guess Moon River, Audrey Hepburn. From that guitar to its guitar version, the lute, the moon lute from China. In the world of art, moon masks of Africa. Moon obviously shows up in art in many ways. Eye-wateringly beautiful, Makie from Japan. Architecturally, we can see a moon gate, there's also moon windows, and we've also spent some time already in the beginning on the moon garden. There are also decorative items that have been inspired by the moon, such as this mirror. And so for example, Chinese writers had often identified a mythical rhinoceros that is said to have gazed at the moon, or there's also some cow of Wu that apparently pants upon seeing the moon, it's probably love struck. And so when this mirror stand was originally held a mirror, the anim this animal would appear to be looking at the moon, gaze at the moon with love. We see also moon had inspired the decoration of a tea bowl. Look how beautiful. As the liquid, when you imbibe the liquid, as the drink drains away, it reveals the crescent moon, the clouds. So it's right here, the crescent moon right there, the clouds and the blossoming plums. In literature, there are many, a la luna, the poetry by Leopardi, moon inspired literature. I am not even gonna to touch this, but the one that I wanna remind you is, I'm sure, because I'm betting you read to your children, those of you who have grandchildren, I'm sure there's a beloved book. Some child tonight will be comforted to sleep with the story, Good Night Moon. And this story has no mystery, no hero, no handsome prince or fairy godmother. And yet this treasure has lulled millions of children to sleep in more than two dozen countries for 75 years. And it's kind of funny, you don't even think about it, but the simple writing is very effectively expansive. The great green room in this good night moon book, what does it say? Good night stars, good night air, good night noises everywhere. If you listen to that, it is so abundantly overflowing of calmness. It almost has the emotional luster of moonlight, calms you. No wonder the rhinoceros of the cow of Wu pantingly looks up to it. Love struck. On a side note, when I was researching, I laughed observing if you look at the cow, it's very gently done. The one that is jumping over the moon, I think they removed the udders. So I looked it up and it's it, there was some controversy. They didn't want the cow to have udders. Did the publishers think it would offend a child as if the child would care? The child that drinks milk, where do they think the milk comes from? These odd things I find. 
I try to not share half of them because I don't want to bore you to tears, but they make me laugh. So the moon has obviously inspired, among other things, science. This model is off because they're showing this is the moon and this is the earth. We know that is absolutely not true. It's, if anything, it's the other way around because the earth is up definitely not smaller than the moon. That is why we have a gravitational force, the size that we do. But it is the moon that had inspired Galileo. His telescope confirmed what was known years, centuries before the Greeks knew it, that the earth is round, no flat earthers there. So his telescope had confirmed that the moon is a body of matter, of science. And that it wasn't just a religious object, that it wasn't this beautiful religious maiden, you know, Casta Diva up there. It was a body of science. And Galileo paid dearly for that truth because he had been imprisoned for life for proving it. That simple telescope birthed curiosity in countless successive generations. And for those of you who live near Chicago, this place in Wisconsin is a gem. It's about an hour away from Chicago. Then both the gardens and the architecture is very impressive. And it has stellar astronomical pedigree as well. You might recognize this, this fella right there. So we now watch the stars in observatories around the world, South America, Hawaii. This, is, this presentation is not about that. It's really about the larger vision. And but though this is not the focus of the presentation, I would like to point out that in the mad zeal for knowledge, it is important not to chuck the baby with the bathwater. So this observatory is in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And the native Hawaiians object dearly to having their ancestral grounds dug up, disturbed for science because they want to build another observatory. Imagine if the National Cemetery was dug up to make space for a science lab, you'd be upset as well. Barring the emotional sensitivities, I would like to point out native knowledge isn't quaint. Just because that wisdom appears as songs and poetry does not imply that it wasn't founded on ages of patient, astute observation. Isn't that the bedrock of science? Observe carefully. And during her imprisonment, this last queen regent from Hawaii, not queen, uh, regent, queen, Queen Lili Wo Kalani, Lili Wo Kalani, I think that's how you pronounce it, had translated the Hawaiian creation chant Kumulipo into English so that the rest of the world would know about her heritage. The Hawaiians are very intimately tied to nature. So they capture what they know through their songs. Cultures across the world do this. Indigenous knowledge needs to be protected and archived. I think I've said this before again, and I firmly believe it. This fact applies globally. All cultures in the context of the moon, all cultures have worshiped the moon. There are deep ties to the moon. In parts of the world, they plant seeds to the cycles of the moon because I think the moon makes the plants grow better, which could be true because the moon pulls the water. There's a, it's not just mythology. It's just, there's a reasoning behind it. You know, they say in India, the sun rides on a seven horse chariot. Well, okay. If you look at the seven spectrums of the sun, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, it's seven. A lay person cannot understand wavelengths, but they can understand a chariot pulling a horse. So one has to learn to understand this data. So again, the archive indigenous knowledge. Reason I'm saying this about the observatory is, for example, there was a Tahitian priest, Tupaya, I think his name was, who had helped Captain Cook navigate the ocean's leagues of blankness. He didn't do it through maps because they didn't use maps then. The Tahitians or the indigenous, they used their memory from the songs. To Tupaya's mind, the islands were lit up as they blinked across his mind's eye, lit up by his language, by speech. And from memory, he set the names and described the locations of more than 200 islands that spangled the sea, stretching from Tonga to the Australs. That's about 1,200 miles. And so when Captain Cook then drew his meticulous chart of the Society Isles, the map had the inscription discovered by Lieutenant James Cook, 1769. Tupaya wasn't credited. This is not about getting Tupaya credit. This is more about acknowledging and actually treasuring indigenous knowledge. 
it'll come in handy. We cut down trees, which probably has medicinal properties that we need. And we go off to other planets trying to, who knows what. So anyway, ancestral knowledge undergirds a lot of what we now credit as science. And this is again true globally. To denigrate such sacred space to create temples to science seems to be, to me at least, an unsound principle. Because we wouldn't easily destroy a Greek temple, would be to create a scientific building. Because look, look how the Western systems, and I do emphasize Western systems. This is not because in this, every system, every culture has a name. Our common language is English, so I'm saying Western systems. They're named after Mercury, Jupiter. Obviously, we value mythical stories, the Western stories we value. And these are all mythical stories. Jupiter is a name of mythology. One of the moons of Jupiter is Eo. And here in the painting in the story, here is Jupiter doing what the Holy Scripture tells us to do, love thy neighbor, ensconcing, befolding the moon Eo, wrapped in love. Look at this. Here's the definition of a moon. Effectively, a satellite. <laughs> now, scientists have been studying the satellites of the many planets with great interest. And I'm thrilled that they name them with such flourish, with such poetics names. You know, not X, what is it? C, T, P, O, whatever these alphabetical names are. Oberon, Triton. I'm sure there's somewhere a Caliban hiding somewhere. Do you think Shakespeare knew he would inspire such names? Jupiter has 79 moons. Eo, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa. Planet, Earth, planet Saturn, look at it. More than what? Almost 80 plus moons. And look at the pathway. That orbit, all those, all those satellites and the ringed also. That's Saturn. Titan is the largest moon in our solar system, second largest actually, and that's part of Saturn's satellites. And even far away, Uranus systems have satellites, 22 minor moons, five major moons. And look at the names of Uranus's moon, Oberon, Miranda, Perdita, moons again do inspire poetry. I love that the scientists give such beautiful names. The one that circles us for 29.5 days every month. She who lends us beauty and helps sustain us. The Western world simply identifies it as the moon. I find it insulting. It's akin to referring to you and I as a human. Yes, I am, but I'm much more than that. Literally, because born on a full moon, I am named after the moon in my culture, my birth culture, we have lots of names for the moon. Shoma is one of them. Shom for boys, Shoma for the girl. Moon Monday, Shombar, Moon Day. The moon, she means the world to me. I'm comforted knowing that she watches over me as I work late into the night. Last night, she was brighter than a light bulb. It was amazing. It was coming in through the transom, it was lovely. And when I'm heartbroken and alone, she witnesses my tears and I find deep solace in the belief that like her, I can transcend all that hurts me. She is gonna be absolutely resplendent tonight. Make the time, please. Soak in her beauty. Let her gaze upon you. Feel her presence. I wish you joy. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing now. <laughs>